Good afternoon, everyone. I'm grateful to stand here and glad to welcome you all to this academic event. Professor Michael Taragan, Chairperson, KCHR, has joined with us via Zoom. And uh, I welcome Professor Taragan for this session. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Professor G. Arunima, Director, KCHR, who will be presiding over the session. And we'd like to extend a special thanks to our guest of honor, Professor Sanal V, Professor of Philosophy at the Department of Humanities and Social Science, IIT Delhi, and presently, scholar in residence at KCHR, will be later speaking on the topic, Can History Save Philosophy? I would like to cordially welcome all the participants and our KCHR team to this public lecture. I would also like to extend my warm welcome to all the audience who have joined via Zoom Meet. At the end of talk, we'll have a question and answer session. And those who have joined via Zoom Meet can type their questions in the chat box and also they can use the raise hand option. And I would also like to uh, make a request. Kindly, please do put your mobile phones on silent mode. And uh, now I invite Professor Arunima to preside over the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to uh, welcome Professor Sanil B, who has been with us from the middle of July for three months as our scholar in residence. As many of you know, our scholar in residence program is for uh, scholars of eminence whom we invite for a period of three months. And we um, invite them on the basis um, of the understanding that uh, they will bring with them their expertise in their areas. Uh, specifically uh, in the areas of history or social sciences and humanities, uh, and if possible, pertaining to uh, research on Kerala or South Indian studies, though we are not particularly um, discriminatory in this sense. We do welcome scholars who work on other parts of the world. Um, those of you who know um, Professor Sanil's work know that he has a wide range. Uh, he's actually a philosopher who started his career uh, or his academic life as a mechanical engineer. Uh, and then it is after that, uh, as I was told by a teacher of his, um, that they gently uh, sort of turned him towards his real passion, which is philosophy. Uh, he did his engineering degree here in the CET. In those days, it was the REC, Trivandrum. Uh, then he went on to IIT Kanpur to do a PhD. His work, uh, his early work, uh, and a main part of his work, focuses on Western philosophy. Uh, and uh, I would say without any doubt that amongst the many scholars uh, engaging with different areas of philosophy that I have heard, Professor Sanil's understanding of Western philosophy is not only clear and concise, but it is also provocative and immensely uh, edifying for those of us who have not worked with uh, In the past three decades that we have known each other, um, professionally and personally, I would also say that it has been a greatly enriching experience for me to have heard him speak on such a wide range of subjects as um, you know, Plato's philosophy, um, ethics, cinema, art, technology, any number of uh, areas to which he brings his own kind of special engagement. He has a very engaging style. And fortunately for many of us, he writes both in English and Malayalam. He has held many fellowships nationally and internationally uh, in different parts of the world from England to Europe to the U United States. Uh, and each of these has actually produced a new kind of insight in the areas that he's been studying. In more recent times, I've heard him think and speak about Gandhi in different contexts, including COVID-19, which has been a recent obsession of his. Um, I would say that it is actually a matter of great pride for KCHR 
that we could actually convince him to come here and be part of our scholar in residence program. Now, as part of the scholar in residence program, we have an expectation uh, that the scholars will also lead research workshops. Uh, we had a very vibrant research workshop recently, uh, which was held actually in the same venue at, at the Musket Hotel uh, for a period of a week in which we had research scholars from different parts of the country who came to engage in different areas of <laughs> think about different areas of philosophy. And it was a very, very enriching experience. So with these few words, let me welcome Sanil uh, to what is actually, uh, should be a really exciting uh, area <laughs> of uh, thinking, which is can history save philosophy? Welcome. Dear friends, uh, thank you, Arunima, for uh, this uh, generous uh, introduction. So I have had a great time here as a scholar in residence, though it is called scholar in residence. It has actually been scholar at work for so many days, and it's a pleasure to do that here with uh, you know the atmosphere which we have at uh, KCHR and uh, the title of the talk is Can uh, History Save Philosophy? Definitely historians have saved me to do some philosophy here. So thank you, KCH, for that. And uh, this topic, Can History Save Philosophy? It indicates that philosophy is in some trouble or in some danger and it needs to be saved. And also there is a certain confidence in, about history, right? So having said we, they can save, but at least there is a hope of, uh, there's an expression of certain confidence in uh, history. And also the word save has very religious connotations, right? It's redemption, saving. It's a religious, uh, uh, you know, connotations. And first of all, let me say that this religious connotation is going to be the focus as we really proceed. Because uh, this topic, my kind of hidden aim or ultimate aim is to look at a claim which is made by one of the 20th century Indian uh, philosophers whom I have been working for a while, Ramachandra Gandhi, who was grandson of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, analytical philosopher who was trained under uh, a major logician and analytical philosopher, Peter Strawson at Oxford. And uh, he made this statement that history of philosophy in India is a constellation of the sages, right? It's a strange statement. So my attempt actually is to understand that statement that the history of philosophy in India is should be seen as a constellation of sages. By sages, you know, he wrote articles on, you know, there is a book, an edit, you know, an edited work of uh, Ramajandra Gandhi called Seven Sages. It's the, the concept of Saptarshis, right? And that's an editor's contribution where he actually discusses sages like Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, Sharada Devi, uh, Arabindo and uh, Mother, Vivekananda, Ramana Maharshi, Mahatma Gandhi, etc. Right? And he actually says them, this is the cricket team of sages. That's what he proposes. Right? This, this, this cricket team of this constellation, a spatial metaphor, this is what, and this is a very provocative claim in, in India today where any reference to religion is suspect. Right? We know that we live under the threat of religious nationalism and any critical vigilance demand that you know we take these uh, suggestions uh, very carefully, and you know just why I'm a bit uh, sort of uh, I can be a bit careless with respect to Ramu Gandhi because 
he wrote this great book is one of the major texts which is a really rigorous response to Babri Masjid's demolition was his Sita's Kitchen, where he says this is actually not Rama's birthplace alone, but it's also Sita ki at the soil. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, history, as we know, is a very envious position in India. Right? My confidence is not misplaced because this, the, the nation's fate is decided on a religious question which uh, the historians and archaeologists were invited to resolve, right? You know the Babri Masjid issue. We, we saw historical discourse, archaeology, and the juridical discourse coming together, and no discipline is at this kind of an envious position, uh, you know, in India. Whereas uh, philosophy is in a pretty sad situation, right? You know, the word philosophy today exists as a respectability only in this degree, doctor of philosophy, PhD, right? And so everybody is a philosopher and nobody learns philosophy. You know that it's only people with the least, you know, mark goes to philosophy. And also university as a philosophical university, the, the highest degree in the university is called PhD because philosophy, university is expected to be a philosophical institution, right? Uh, but uh, today it's no longer a uh, philosophical industry. We know what's happening to universities uh, in India and all around the world. And another thing about philosophy is that all other disciplines in the university today, both literary studies and social sciences, have been through a certain critical moment, right? And you know, the symptomatic is it's expressed in the emergence of various studies, your cultural studies, gender studies, etc., where these disciplines have questioned their own presuppositions. And uh, the question of colonialism has become important for. Uh, English literature, history, social sciences, etc. Now, one discipline which remained untouched about this colonial, uh, you know, this, this issue, the self-critical one would be uh, philosophy. It's almost like philosophy is the critical activity or it doesn't have to undertake it with respect to any specific historical situation. And we think that we have a, you know, either we say that the only philosophy is rational philosophy is Western philosophy, or we say we had this great classical tradition and there was an interruption. Colonialism is almost like a coffee break in India's history. Now that it's gone, we, we can just get back to our uh, traditional classical Indian uh, philosophy. But this, uh, apart from these kinds of, uh, you know, rhetorical institutional diagnosis of the situation, at least around 91 years ago, a philosopher in Bengal called Kesi Bhattacharya expressed his kind of evaluation of the situation of philosophy in India. I just want to read out a long quotation from him. That Indian mind has simply lapsed in most cases for our educated men and has subsided below the conscious level of our culture. It operates still in the persisting routine of their family life and in some of their social religious practices which have no longer any meaning for them. It neither welcomes nor resists the ideas through new education. It dares not exert itself in the cultural sphere. What he noticed was a kind of cultural paralysis, right? And both the philosophy, which is coming from the West, which is part of the university education, and also the classical philosophy in India, both didn't have any impact on the life of the mind in uh, India, right? He says the thinking has become a very soulless, uh, you know, exercise. And Western, uh, you know, ideas have only created what he calls the shadow of mind uh, in India. And, you know, people, so when he makes this uh, judgment, right, it's not like it's because he is somebody who is out of the cutting edge of philosophy at that time. Uh, K.C. Bhattacharya had was proposing extremely original interpretation of Kant uh, in India and was also writing on, you know, Vishishtadvaita, etc. So he is very competent in both the tradition and even producing original work uh, in the tradition. Of course, uh, 
Nobody in the West reads those things. Uh, but even he felt this. And uh, if you take at another context, the time is, is the time of philosophers like Hiriad mm -hmm. Haldar, who is writing in British journal, philosophy journals about Hegel, right? And in the, uh, the Western philosophy, you know, Hegel is associated with ideas like absolute, but they were, you know, the Western tradition didn't have the confidence to use things like reason is absolute. And you will find, you know, Haldar writing from here saying that no, in India, the idea of absolute is so available to all of us, you should stand by the strength of your uh, tradition. So even when, you know, all these uh, creative activities happening, they felt that it's very soulless kind of activity, uh, which is uh, going on. Right? And this is the situation that to which, uh, when I say that can history say philosophy, this is the situation which uh, I am presenting it. Suppose if you think that the situation no longer is there and philosophy is doing very well, then I think the rest of the talk is not going to make uh, uh, any sense. And also, you know, I am not a historian and the only history to which I have some familiarity is history of philosophy. And so that's going to be my point of entry uh, into this. Right? So there is history of philosophy. In philosophy, there is history of philosophy and also philosophy of history, right? And what I want to pursue is this relation between history of philosophy and philosophy of history. Now, philosophers, uh, as you know, have a tendency to coin philosophy of X, right? They will say about everything because philosophy is going to give the essence of whatever it is, right? We will tell you what history is, we will tell you what science is. You know, there is a discipline called philosophy of science, right? And they think that, okay, if the philosophers don't know what the meaning of knowledge in science. So we will tell them, right? And, uh, you know, greatest, one of the Nobel laureate, uh, philo you know, physicist, uh, Feynman once said, you know, the philosophy of science is to science what ornithology is for birds. And we don't need this philosophy of things for people to uh, do it, this. Right? And uh, when philosophy of history does, what they try to do is they try to give some epistemological clarification about the meaning of knowledge in science, whether it's history can, you know, knowledge is same as scientific knowledge is the way of testing is different in both of them, et cetera. Or it can have an ontological approach to history and ask, you know, what kind of an entity which have something called historicity, right? What kind of entity for which past matters so much, right? So uh, this is what philosophy of history uh, does. But uh, can philosophy have, can have a history? Now that's not very easy to think through. It's not very easy to think about history of philosophy. What would be history of philosophy? For example, history, philosophy always poses very eternal problem, right? What is reality, right? What am I or whom, who am I? What is truth? Uh, these questions uh, doesn't seem to have, there is no history. It's there, they, they, are, they are not determined by, uh, you know, its cultural or socio-political uh, context, right? And uh, the, philosophical utterance, right? Seems to have a context transcending ability, right? They just keep on. And this is something which when you try to teach philosophy, people lose interest. Well, those are the same questions they have been debating for so many centuries, no answers. Why waste our uh, time, right? And uh, this is actually, a, a, you know, reality because two ways in which we can talk about context, like either the context have some causal effect on what philosophers are saying, or what philosophers are saying is a reflection of reality outside. None of these cause effect relationship, reality reflection relationship, none of them seems to hold in the case of uh, uh, philosophy, right? And when you come into philosophy, what you know that there are different views, there are different answers to the same question. Nobody agrees on anything. Right, almost everything, there are infinite number of uh, views. And so that leads to skepticism, right, on the one side. And against this, there is this philosophies 
context transcending ambition where you have something called the truth which you are actually tracking which is a dogmaticism right so it's all the time oscillating between skepticism on the one side and dogmaticism on the other side and when you try to write the history of philosophy right there seems to be two options left to us one is that you look at write the philosophy as a system but in other words you say that history of philosophy and philosophy of history these are mirror images right or in the sense of you think about a certain uh, you know history of philosophy which reproduces and at the same time coincides with a history of philosophy it's not like you are they are you know just you are collecting so many views together and write about history some linear but there is an inner structure to this uh, uh, philosophical the various views which are coming out in history that's when you say that actually philosophy is the march of uh, you know reason right then you take for example when you write the history of philosophy you take a philosopher like spinoza right and then you realize that okay spinoza actually is proposing a philosophy of the substance you. and then you realize okay if you this cannot be substance cannot be the ultimate reality there is subject then you say okay there you have kant who is a philosopher of the subject now these are partial views then this history you are writing from the standpoint of somewhere subject is identical to the substance right so that's why you systematize uh, the the views which are uh, coming up now another option is to say that no each ph philosophy philosophers work is absolutely singular in itself right each one comes with his own uh, problems he always his own unique it's almost like a work of art right so philosophy is actually a totally singular uh, you know production of uh, uh, you know uh, views and uh, these two options that like you write the history of philosophy as a system or you look at the history of philosophy as singular works both of them ultimately will suppress history right because if you write it as a system finally each of the stages are actually anticipation of this final stage from there it is systematized right and if it is actually singular work then definitely there is no conversation between uh, you know any of them right so you will find somebody like hegel who is a uh, example for writing the history of philosophy which is driven by the philosophy of history right and there the history of philo philosophy will be superseded by something called logic right you have the hegel's logic where you can actually tell what is the logical structure where it philosophy this will not make any reference to any historical uh, happening so the other way is the singular so what the attempt to draw a history of philosophy guided by a philosophy of history ultimately end up in suppressing the question of history right so uh, now this historical uh, and what i want to sort of propose to you is that slowly let us can we encounter a stage where the history of philosophy will declare to to be free from the domination of a philosophy of history that's also a time when that will be done when historians themselves make a claim that a notion of history which is not superseded by philosophy of history and what i want to suggest to you at the end of the talk to anticipate is that it is this history which is freed from the domination of philosophy of history that at all if philosophy can be saved by something it is to buy this uh, you know uh, history now when you come back to this way of writing history of philosophy within the ambit of a philosophy of history we know where that led to right which which is led to as in the case of hegel and various other thinkers in eurocentrism right so eurocentrism is the claim that uh, for example it's better to see eurocentrism with respect to a historical question about it origin right for example you say that philosophy originated in greece right that's the statement which you uh, find or you say that history itself originated in the west 
And you know, there are other claims that geometry originated in the uh, West. And uh, today, if the moment somebody makes this claim, we immediately object to it by saying that what about things happening in India? Do you think that India, there was no philosophy? We had philosophy much before you had uh, in the Greece, right? So we have many things, not only really philosophy, also have aircrafts, which you say that, okay, aircraft was done in some, you know, in Europe, we'll say we had the Mana Purana. So it's always a question of what we had something before, uh, you know, them. So there was a very uh, joke which uh, Pushpan Singh's once popularized. The one religious group in India did some excavation near their religious place and they found that there was, they got a long street, steel wire. So they said uh, we had telephony in our tradition. So the competing group went and dug up near their religious place and they didn't find any wire. So they said we had wireless in our tradition, <laughs> right? So this is a peculiar thing. Why this kind of countering this claim is because we, this claim is made very seriously. There's a point to the Eurocentric, uh, you know, claim uh, because uh, what they say originated in, uh, in, uh, in Europe is what Hegel will call uh, philosophy as a pursuit of a concrete universal, right? It's not like abstract, okay, whether they have this idea about truth, etc., or they have the idea about freedom. But the question is, that doesn't develop. That doesn't say that what it is. When you take history seriously, we said, look, these are all philosophers for him or historians for him. So it is informed by philosophical history. So history of what? History of concrete universals, which are concrete universal. These are universals which are not empty abstractions. They are really grounded in the unfolding, in the historical, uh, you know, unfolding. That's why history of philosophy is brought under the philosophy of history. For example, Hegel will say that why philosophy originated only in the West, because it's not that in India. They all knew that India had great, Orient had great philosophical thought. But in the Orient, only the despot was free. Only freedom was, the ideas were great, but here only one person, the despot was free. Whereas in Greece, some people were free, right? Uh, the Greek, you know, native, uh, uh, the men were free. So only in the West that everyone is free, right? And philosophy exists only when the, you know, the concepts, are active in a society where everyone is uh, uh, free. Or when, you know, Husserl says that uh, geometry originated in Greece. What is geometry? In all other traditions had, uh, you know, Egypt, everywhere, they were able to do pretty sophisticated calculations, right? Uh, but they don't develop uh, geometry. And many things which went into geometry, we know from books like Black Athena, that they came from all kinds of other, uh, you know, civilization. And what actually makes geometry is neither the availability of some geometric essences like circles or some method called logical uh, thinking, but the fact that as you know, the geometric ideality is a historical ideality. Only in the West that an ideality can develop through a historical process, a sense of history. And uh, actually the Husserl recognizes that in India, uh, there was great thought. What Hegel will say, there was ruthless cognitive practices uh, in India, right? But what happened was these ruthless cognitive practices were uh, pursued in close communities, right? So you come up with truth in astronomy, you come up with truth in mathematics, in grammar, but it will not impinges on, impinge on human existence as such. That happens only in Greece, that it is. Whereas in India, it doesn't impinge on human existence uh, you know, as such. And it's also very close to the diagnosis of uh, uh, you know, Ambedkar. When Ambedkar uh, says that the problem in India was that India had the great pursuit of truth, but uh, we didn't love truth. Right? So, and for, for, you know, for Ambedkar, 
philosophy is the pursuit of truth and religion is the love for truth and in india there was no love for truth people you know enter into various things i belong to this caste or i went in the tradition i keep on doing what everybody else is doing and truth is so potent that it has to be nurtured with love and if you don't nurture with love then it end up in producing hatred and ambedkar derives the caste hatred in india into the lack of love for this uh, you know truth so the diagnosis is you know something like uh, uh, that that is the when they say that something originated in europe right that the claim has to something to do with the relationship between the history of philosophy and philosophy of uh, history there unless we break that we cannot just if you come up with empirically something like okay we had something like this it will not uh, you know engage with that question and another important thing that happens with uh, uh, you know this modern uh, western situation when we face something like hegel where history of philosophy and philosophy or history come to face to face you know led by each other is a philosophy withdrawing itself from cosmology right for the 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 rise of history the importance of history for thought right in the uh, you know 18th 19th century philosophy right in europe goes along with the idea about the disappearance of cosmology as a discipline philosophers no longer do uh, cosmology that's left to <coughs> the uh, physicists to do right so it is this turning away from cosmology becomes a certain intense preoccupation with uh, history right and uh, as we know that what we call modern european uh, you know philosophy is a criticism of metaphysics right metaphysics is a theory about reality and we say that our theory of relativity should be reality should be left to natural sciences to uh, pursue right now but cosmology actually asked so there are two disciplines we can think about metaphysics is the the discipline which asks the question what is reality and cosmology is asked the question what is reality in so far as we inhabit it right it is the reality of making sense of this whole world in which we are uh, you know uh, part of it right and uh, so the metaphysics is now undermined we can't just really think about what is the nature of ultimate reality etc right so then kant will say that okay what philosophy can actually tell you is what are the conditions for knowledge right we actually come to know about Uh, reality through science but we can actually give tell you what is the structure right which makes what are the conditions which makes this knowledge possible uh, in this uh, uh, domain right and everything else is you know you can't speak about this in fact the uh, 20th century philosopher and ramachandra gandhi's uh, you know teacher peter strossen make a distinction between uh descriptive metaphysics and revisionary metaphysics descriptive metaphysics would just tell you what is the structure of our thought that's something which we can tell what is the structure of my thought so that i can refer to entities in the world i can talk about mind etc uh, that is called a descriptive metaphysics revisionary metaphysics is what ought to be the structure so that i can know the reality out there he said look that uh, is not a uh, Uh, it's not something which philosophy can pursue maybe poets can talk about it but philosophy cannot uh, talk about this and you will find uh, people like kant before he get into the critical period is trying to engage with newton by saying that okay somehow newtonian physics has to be brought together with wolfian metaphysics and we need to just tell us it's not enough for you know uh, science to tell us what is reality right so we have to put that into you know other reflections which are coming from other fields in politics morality uh, etc religion etc and just put it together and give you a theory of cosmology and you find that uh, what we call critical modern thinking is where this task is given up right and when kant write uh, you know critique of uh, pure reason 
there is what he actually diagnoses is that if you try to give a theory of everything, not in the sense of science, slowly, progressively meeting, but you take all that thing and then try to give a theory of everything, you end up in contradiction. You end up in antinomies, right? So the whole idea about cosmological antimony is that when you think about the world, you always think that's a totality. But when I think about the totality, it is always open to infinities. There is always something outside the totality, which I think about, right? So it is, uh, you know, it went into antinomies of uh, reason. Now, so it is, it is at this point, that is the predominance of history under the tutelage of philosophy or history comes at the time when philosophy gives up its claim to provide cosmology, right? Now, this is not any big abstract thing, just talk about, uh, you know, the, our, the way we talk about the virus today, right? So, you know, you, we all now know that there are these colorful round things, right? Like Amar Chitragada, they are all there. They are there in your body, jump into your body, right? And as you know that if you do epidemiology at a certain level, the reality of something is not like this, right? So, so there has to be a philosophical supplement to the actual theories to say that what is reality. Instead of that, what we do is we, since there are no cosmologies, our newspapers will every day give you, this is how things are, right? And then you wear a mask and then you, uh, you know, take vaccination and our, as our dear prime minister told us you need to have faith in science and that's what you have in cosmological project goes you will have faith in uh, science and uh, this problem was uh, very seriously debated uh, you know and since this is i'm referring to this particular debate because historians are familiar with a philosopher called rg collingwood who wrote this great book on the idea of uh, history, right? And uh, uh, Collingwood was actually somebody who went through the trauma of this disappearance of metaphysics in philosophy. You know, when he was the, uh, you know, uh, the professor at, I think, Oxford, that's the time when AJIS, famous analytical philosophy, classic came, language, logic, and truth, where the metaphysics was demolished. The metaphysical inquiry was shown to be a senseless, uh, you know, activity. And Collingwood is somebody who tried to think uh, against this and tried to say that we philosophy has a project. But when he actually says, "What is that project?" It's interesting that science actually come up with scientific knowledge at any historical situation will have certain presuppositions, what he called absolute presuppositions. And this absolute presupposition changes over time, right? And what metaphysics is, look at this, you know, a description of these metaphysics, these presuppositions of the scientific uh, enterprise. It's very close to what, you know, uh, Strawson will call a descriptive metaphysics. And there is a philosopher who was uh, a mathematician and also was engaging with theory of relativity, et cetera, Whitehead, who will now engage with this question. There's a debate between Collingwood and, uh, you know, Whitehead. And, uh, you know, just to draw some, you know, metaphorical connections here, Ramachandra Gandhi, whom we are going to consider towards the last five minutes of this talk, uh, he actually wrote a major book on Whitehead uh, philosophy. Right? When, we, when I want to come to the question about Sage, this is a crucial point where Collingwood is defending the case of a minimal metaphysics, but metaphysics has as history. Right? Uh, the Whitehead was making a claim, no. That is science actually come up with this you know, uh, presuppositions, but philosophy has to intervene and say whether these absolute presuppositions are actually giving a theory of everything. Philosophy has to say, inter there is a cosmological vocation and we cannot wait for science to finally come out with the correct. No, at every point you'll have to say, and for to do that, you have to look at what notions of reality has been given by religion, by mysticism, by political artist, everyone. 
and a philosopher has to cut across all these things as he will say you have to bring your religion into your physics and your physics into your poetry and you have to give a theory about uh, uh, the nature of reality as Whitehead says as the complete fact there has to be a theory about the complete fact and that complete fact is that which is a serious cognitive claim based in front of her. There's a, there's a serious claim about reality is made and that serious about that seriousness has to be captured by a cosmological uh, you know, encounter. So this is the time you will find that there is a crack appearing in this valorization of history in the Western uh, tradition. That is, we can think about cosmology, but without regressing it back into the pre-critical cosmologies of uh, Kant. Of course, this is also a moment for me to take a one-minute you know, digression and to say that uh, another great uh, philosopher who passed away last week, Saul Kripke, uh, wrote a major paper on uh, Collingwood, right? Whether we can actually see some of these uh, points. He was a logician, a prodigy who developed uh, complete semantics for modal logic when he was 17. Apparently, he had read the entire Shakespeare when he was seven years old, right? And this paper on Collingwood, he wrote it as, um, you know, uh, when he was during his, I think, undergraduate uh, days. And now this is, he passed away and also we should think he lost his job because he was an unpardonable sexual harasser. Uh, so, um, this, this picture which we have portrayed where you know, history of philosophy mirrors guided by history of philosophy. We saw one symptom of it is valorization of history over cosmology. And you find cracks appearing there. But this picture was turned around and a demand was made for a history, which is free of this driven by philosophy of, uh, you know, history. Uh, is happening in the one to say you know it has a long history but uh, at least in 20th century right and i want to just quickly uh, go through some of those seminal points that one is uh, the work of michel foucault when he reads kant's what is enlightenment and also nietzsche's use and disadvantage of history for uh, uh, life. Where the claim of history is now questioned from the standpoint of archaeology and genealogy, genealogy, right? And so there is a questioning that is this history as a historicity of man as a history, historicity as an essence tracked by a philosophy of uh, history, right? And this is questioned by one is, we look at history and replacing it with a genealogically informed archeology span as which happens in Foucault. And also a redefinition of philosophy as geophilosophy. You will find this idea coming up, right? Uh, in the contemporary, uh, philosophy. And what they are trying to say is that another philosopher, Heidegger, has already made a claim that the history, origin of history can be located in history itself, right? You can actually locate the origin of history in, uh, that what we are actually saying is that every a priori structure through which we make sense of reality all these are absolutely contingent, right? They don't have any rootedness in essence, essence of man or essence of reality or everyone. But what happens in Heidegger and in all those people who then try to do is, so where is this origin of history in history? So it will keep sliding back because, you know, if you go there Greek, then it will go to pre-Socratic, it will keep sliding. So you have this peculiar structure of an origin as it's like a horizon, as you go towards it, it moves back. 
and uh, you suddenly find in 1960s a philosopher comes and say oh i can precisely date the origin of history it's around 18 uh, you know between end of 18th century and beginning of 19th century is the greatest dating philosopher of our time michel foucault he will date everything origin of literature origin of sexuality right origin of you know once in an interview when he was he didn't know the date at which feeding bottles were there so he said i wish should be cover myself in shame because i didn't know when the dates so he said look you can really date the origin of uh, things you know how is it that and that is the real claim that claim can be made only from history is taken out of the philosophy of history which would have prevented such a precise uh, dating right and that is also the claim that history has no essence and reason that we said history will be written as the march of reason the reason has chance origins right reason is something which origins in absolutely chancey moment right so here is a quote the genealogist needs history to dispel the chimera of the origin somewhat in the manner of a pious philosopher who needs a doctor to exorcise the shadow of his soul right a genealogist is now this new guy who is going to date the origin of history he also needs history but he needs history only in the sense that a pious philosopher needs a doctor to exorcise the shadow of his soul he must be able to recognize the events of history its jolts its surprises its unsteady victories and unpalatable defeats the basis of all beginnings atavisms and hereditaries right so the the early, when you think about origin as one point right which is actually the ideality what is going to come later is going to be born from that uh, origin right it is this origin right this is what philosophy of history was all the time imposing it of history and these philosophers are now taking on we need to th rethink about this nature of origin that's what is needed so the two ways in which you think about origin is origin as descent or origin as emergence right these are the two ways in which you think about uh, you know descent and uh, you know just it is much easier to think about this uh, through you know if you take an example from evolutionary uh, theory right evolutionary theory has this problem of the mitochondrial eve right suppose if you take all people here and we just track down the mothers of all the you know mother it is through mother that uh, the mitochondria comes to us so you try the mother of all the people who are there and then you take the mother of all the people who are there so you go like that you will reach the uh, you know the first mother right and then you take the same thing for men you have the f chromosome so you take the father of all the people who are right now and then you know and you know simple arithmetic that it will come down so then you go to the father of that father of that you will get the original adam now do you think the original adam and the eve were married they were a couple obviously not there's no necessity that they have even met right there's no need that they have ever met right so origin has this peculiar the what you call origin is actually a dispersion it's not like there's no common place of uh, the the origin where what play a role in the origin need not have met and this origin people will actually change if you actually do this calculation after 10 years you don't come at the same there's no necessity that we will reach at the same adam and eve as the uh, right so there is a such so this is the way the uh, you know the new uh, thinkers are exploding this notion about uh, origin right and the same way about the idea about emergence are also like this that uh, you have uh, say for example if you how something like goodness emerges when nietzsche write the history it's not like people who are strong people impose their idea of goodness or weak people you know they are weak so they wanted to valorize from their weakness come up with a concept of weakness no but there is a struggle between weak the weak and the strong but there is no common place they actually meet right it is through such a thing that the uh, something called the history of morality will uh, emerge 
right? So what at the origin is a dispersion of this event. This was a very important, uh, you know, move which happens in the contemporary. Now, these are, uh, we can't really say whether, you know, the Foucault is a philosopher or a historian. All through his life, he said, I am not a philosopher, I am a historian, right? But, uh, so that's not the real issue. The real issue is that he is now working as a historian in order to free history from the dominance of the uh, philosophy of uh, uh, history, right? So uh, that's what happens when this, this, this predominance of this archeological mode where archeological mode is that it is you now, we are not making sense of this through, uh, you know, any such stories. We are making sense of it by saying that all these upheavals, everything can happen in the, the history of Earth. Now, the second move which is happening is what we call geophilosophy, right? There, there, is an, there is this idea about we need to take Earth seriously, right? In other words, we need to make space seriously than uh, the... Uh, now, this is also not uh, something new which is happening, though, you know, in philosophy, what we call in the 20th century, ever since Kant came up with the idea that philosophy is uh, inquiry for the transcendental structures of knowledge. Transcendental structures are the kind of structures which allows us to make sense of the world, right? This, this are not empirically there, it's because space and time, these things are there because of that you can make sense of the world. But there is a critique of this transcendental and saying that no, actually it's not in your consciousness, etc. It's actually in your body. It is in culture. It is in language. So there is a de-transcendentalization which is happening in modern Western thought. And then you know you have strange books like uh, a book on climate, which was written in the 1970s as a response to Heidegger's Being and Time by Vasuji uh, Tesiro by saying that, no, you should actually look at ontological question, what we are, it's not a historical question. It should be asked as a question about climate and about the properties of the uh, earth because he read uh, Being and Time in German itself and immediately a response was produced. And then you have people, great historians like Brodel coming out with the idea about geohistory, right? So there is a move towards this idea about philosophy itself taking earth very, very, serious because modern philosophy defined itself as a Copernican turn. What happens in place like, you know, Copernicus shifted the center of the universe from, not universe, center of our, uh, you know, cosmos from the earth to the sun. What actually he was making is that we can, if you want to make sense of movement of celestial bodies, you shouldn't think about we as stationary, we are, we are moving. Right? So you actually shift this to the movie and you go towards the sun. And now you find a certain Ptolemy and move towards taking the earth very uh, you know, seriously. Now this happens, you, if you look at contemporary philosophy, this development happens many. We are just tracking the place where this is happening. One is you know, those who are familiar with the work of Gilles Deleuze, making a distinction between history and uh, becoming. Right. He says that I belong to a generation that was more or less bulgeoned to death by the history of philosophy, right? So there is a certain restlessness with the question about history. And by saying that, he said, look, uh, you know, uh, when he encountered Heidegger, the question was whether Heidegger was a Nazi or not, but did he bring history of philosophy into, uh, you know, philosophy? And he says history of philosophy as a sort of buggery, or it comes to the same thing, immac immaculate conception. So, you know, he says, what I am going to do is I'm going to take each philosopher and bugger him from behind so that he produces a monstrous child, right? So these are all very angry responses against, you know, philosophy being done in the name of history of philosophy. So geophilosophy is a philosophy which is freed from the history of philosophy. Now, history is about events which are taking place within a state of, you know, in the state of affairs within the world, which is shared by this thing. And people like Deleuze were saying that, look, actually what we should be looking at is, it's not what we are, but what we are becoming. That's the uh, important thing to do it, right? These are, 
and there is a set of concept you will find in contemporary thought coming up delu saying that it is not history but becoming and uh, somebody like foucault saying that it what is important is to look at our actuality right our actuality is what we are actually becoming right so a kind of factual history might get what is there in the world but he said look i am not writing history i am not writing history like that i am writing history in so that we now are at a there is a kind of limit i am tracking that limit where the world is becoming what it is not right it is the world is becoming something else uh now in you know in uh, uh, you know another term which is done is what actually the history is now tracking is the virtual right so virtual is not like possible there are things which are actually happening virtual is not usually possible we say that like you know there are some real things in the world possible mean there were hundred other half cooked reality and some of them get properly cooked and be here but this is not like virtual is something which is fully realized right but which cannot be tracked down in the actual factual uh, world of uh, uh, ours and uh, say for example i'm somebody like uh, you know uh, foucault write the history of prison what is that history supposed to be for example there is a prison revolt right we think that the people who are revolting also has an answer why we are revolting they have to say there is some condition in the uh, prison is miserable right they are actually disciplining us our human reality is violated so historian think of himself as giving a justification for this he said that's not what it is right the person who is rebelling doesn't offers anybody any justification right so history is something which actually right provide justification to people who revolt to make sense of what they are doing given the order of reality protesting is what we are doing whereas focus is no he is already going there whether there are protests right so the idea is that for them i mark that limit which passes through my contemporary reality where things are actually becoming something else right so they are saying look this is what we are now writing the history of now this history is something which is happening outside the uh, philosophy of history now in fact uh, when delius writes about geo philosophy uh, he quotes nietzsche that's an interesting quote uh, so nietzsche says that actually we should write the history in such a way that events are happening not of human design plan reason etc as jolts that's a will of the earth right what would be a will capable of affirming the earth be like what does it want this will without this will without which earth itself remain meaningless what is a quality which also becomes the quality of the earth what is the quality of the earth qua earth he says it is being weightless right things on earth have weight but the real feeling of earth itself is weightless right so we need to have a history which is a history of the weightless right so now any attempt to look for meaning is actually bringing weight into your uh, story right so this is a philosophy which can actually look at uh, its problems without adding this this the weight to us now since we don't have time let me quickly look at okay what will it makes to us uh, such a philosophy how what will it say about the question which we said about supremacy of the west so for example philosophy originated in the west now when delius look at it what happens in in the west is that he looks at the the greek in terms of its geographical features right so what are the geographical features did the coastal line of the greek society is a kind of very fractal design uh, by which the people can from anywhere in the greece they can actually very fast reach the shore right and uh, they are open to the world now the soil in the uh, in the greeks is very arid soil non productive soil so people are driven out right so there is an opening to the world 
at the same time it is surrounded by sea so that it is protected from other big empires of the world the eastern empires of the world right so this is the uh, the geographical conditions and now there are a set of what we can call historical conditions or psychological condition is the belief of the greek that they are autochthonous person that is they are not born out of women right that's one belief of the the thing right they are they 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 come from themselves from the earth itself they don't have any other uh, stuff and the valorization of something called friendship right between people right and the predominance of something called opinion doxa that is you know you anybody's opinion counts we have to debate with you you start with his opinion and then you find out which is right one right so what happens in these in greece is what uh, geo philosophy recognizes is that the interrelationship between these geographic and historical uh, factors this interrelationship is absolute as you drive this interrelationship to its absolute potency uh, happens in greece right now this relationship driven to you know its limit need not produce philosophy right so these these kind of things exist in other parts of the world also that will not produce philosophy it hasn't produced philosophy but what happens is when it is driven to this absolute which happens in uh, you know greeks right we can say it goes almost reckless the relationship it is you know it is pursued to it absolute now conceptual activity become an important aspect of this absolutization right that is when the greek philosophy is uh, born right and uh, first of all that the, all these things can happen in other parts of the world but they need not be driven to their absolutization right and when it is driven to absolutization it need not be become a site for concepts it can become a site for say for example as we say figures there are many you know in indian tradition etc there might be lot of diagrams and mandalas and pictures and people think through figures there is no need to uh, do that right so hence what we call his the, the, the he pursues the idea that philosophy originated in europe right but that europe is now mapped on to a set of geographical and say historical other factors which are driven to a certain uh, absolutization right now in in this sense now it can happen anywhere in the world it is a certain dispersion of thing that it is in nowhere it is tracked down to one particular site or so the the greek philosophy now will be it happens in europe itself now it will be repeated for example in renaissance it will be repeated during the the modern philosophy enlightenment it will be repeated it will be repeated in all other countries like india wherever which is coming under english education it will be uh, you know uh, repeated uh, now so this way of looking at the addressing the question of europe in uh, this right it actually goes against various other solutions which came up for example people have looked at the idea that look idea of europe instead of that we need to have a europe of ideas like you know it's not idea of europe should but europe is a place where many ideas can come together we have other historians trying or let us provisionalize europe right so instead of that what happens in the case of geo philosophy is that you go and you think through the question about origin and that origin how do you map that origin into a, a geometrical uh, into a geographical uh, you know plane so now this is the now one set of operations where we try to look at the question about origin right and make it out of any philosophy of history and it becomes an object of historical practice then philosophy itself transforms by saying that this philosophy is now no longer going to give uh, this kind of master concept for how history has to be uh, written because it is writing the its own history as a contingent occurrence which happens at uh, various uh, places right so this is the operation through which both philosophy freed from philosophy of history and history itself freed from uh, philosophy of history 
right? So this is the kind of uh, philosophical ambience today we face, you know, we can face about these two philosophy of history. And one more thing that I want to mention at this time, who will make another, uh, you know, important contribution for us to think about this question of relation between history and philosophy is Walter Benjamin and his last work on philosophical thesis is on, uh, uh, you know, history. Where, you know, the, we don't have to, we don't have time to go into the details. So as we know that this is, uh, this is his last work, uh, you know, before he committed uh, suicide. And uh, so there he was asking the question that it was a critique of the idea about our sense of history as something progress, progressing, right? So he says the problem with the idea about progress is that every stage is a necessary step for the previous stage and a history of progress cannot remember the injustices and suffering of the past. Right? So he said, look, Marx actually came up with the idea of classless society. It was actually an idea, but Marxists made that into an ideal. An ideal is something towards which we will go. So when will classless society come? Classless society will come in the future. So we are as this is the antechamber of waiting room for this to come, right? So classless society said not nothing like that. Classless society is coming in every interruption, right? A Marxist practice is where, and all these interruptions might be failure, much of them will be failure, right? But every, uh, these interruptions, some kind, some question about the past suffering can absolutely made available and tackled. So he's thinking about a certain way of getting out of this so that, you know, it's not the, the, the homogeneous, as he called the homogeneous time of progress, which history is giving, right? So in order to overcome uh, that, he is proposing two things. First of all, he said, we need to think about an idea about an image of history where the past and the present coincide. Right at every point, not under the name of any waiting for some revolution to come, we are going to ask people, okay, you know, keep quiet, all your thing will be addressed later. No, the the, the every cry of the past will be made heard in the present, uh, you know, itself. In that sense, now, uh, you know, all the philosophical techniques by which people were asked to wait will uh, go. And then he says how he is scoring this insight, right? He says this insight where to make the past and the present coincide and it's available in an image, right? This he says dialectical materialism can achieve this only if it brings theology under its, uh, you know, its operation, right? He starts that, uh, essay with this idea about a chess player right? as an automaton is playing the chess and there are ropes which are coming. It's an automaton, a puppet. And there is a hunchback who is hiding under this. And this is an image he took from Allen Poe's story. And then there's a hunchback and the hunchback is maybe moving the automaton. So there is hunchback which is moving and dialectical materialism is the puppet. And theology, he says, is the uh, dwarf who is sitting under that. And you think about this material, he said, look, if you connect dialectical materialism with theology, in some sense, after a while, you really can't make out whether the dwarf is controlling the puppet or the control is controlling. He said, look, the, and now the dwarf cannot see anything. Only dialectical materialism can see anything, right? And what the, the puppet is gaining is a certain movement energy from the religion, right? The theology. And uh, Benjamin says that theology, when I write, he said, look, my philosophy is to theology like a blotting paper, right? Is my philosophy in a way absorbs, you know, theology in such a manner. That he says, if the blotting paper is given the will, it will even change what is written. So it's a peculiar blotting paper which will take away the theological letters, right? 
the ink and will erase all the particular saying it actually does, right? So uh, what we have now gone through is we looked at the question about history of philosophy and philosophy of history. We looked at how the philosophy of history dominates or the history written, right? Under the domination of the philosophy of history. And we looked at what does it mean to turn it around and to free itself from that. And uh, it happens in the case of then it actually invites to a possibility of say something like a Marxist practice, finding a certain proximity to uh, you know, theology. So this possibility of both a philosophy and history, both freeing itself from a certain notion of history, which is provided by uh, you know, philosophy of history. My submission is that this sense of history is what we need to mobilize if you really want to understand Ramajindra Gandhi's claim that the sages of, he said sages are the constellation of the sages or the cricket team of sages are actually the history of philosophy. The writing the history of philosophy is not writing the history of, you know, Shankaracharya, Sankhya, Advaita, Jaina, uh, you know, traditions, but it is the, what uh, the time after the time when K.C. Bhattacharya was saying about the soulless paralyzed nation notion of uh, thinking in India. I will do it in 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, paralyzed situation. What Ramu Gandhi is observing is a great spiritual in a spiritual activity in India, right? There are so many sages from Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and Mother uh, Arabindo and um, you know Meera Vivekananda, Ramana Maharshi. Uh, all these people are flooding the scene, right? So even though he said the, the you know the editor says seven thing, he actually adds people into it. Like he has added Krishna Murti into it. He has added Mother Teresa into his list. So it's a kind of open list of people and their, uh, you know, uh, configuration. Now there is a challenge to us. How do we, many of us who are not even blessed with faith or religious, uh, you know, feelings, right? Um, you have to be a Christian in order to pray that, let you know, to God or faith. And if you are a Hindu, you can't even do that, right? It has to happen through some miracle. So how do we, uh, you know, look at this, uh, uh, and, you know, and uh, this uh, Ramachandra Gandhi's engagement with the sages is very funny because, uh, for example, he uh, thinks about, you know, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, somebody, he gave a talk in, uh, you know, Ramachandra Gandhi gave a talk in California where he says, somebody should have taken Ramakrishna Paramahamsa by a ship to New York and would have placed him in front of Statue of Liberty. He said he would have immediately opened his house and said, Mother Divine, and he would have gone into an ecstasy. Right? And he says about uh, uh, you know case where Ramana Maharshi flying over New York and shaking hands with Grunjo Marx. Right? And he says, look, uh, you West have given us also great saints. So for him, the saints are Gita Garbo, De you know, Dietrich and uh, Marlin Mandro, he says, you have given us great uh, sages, right? So, you know, this has to be done. And so it's not done with great amount of that kind of, uh, you know, reverence for, uh, uh, you know, tradition. And uh, he also, at the, apart from giving lectures, Ramu Gandhi also composed choreographies on all these sages, right? So there is an intuition, which we won't go to in, right? There's an intuition that it is choreography is the way in which you can actually show the interconnection between. So he composed choreography to, and uh, uh, you know, the uh, Shravana Narayan and did the performance of these uh, choreography. So it's a, I just want to suggest to you, there's a very complicated uh, interaction with this question about uh, sages. And uh, he wrote an interesting book, which takes us towards this issue, which is called the availability of religious ideas. He says, look, religious ideas are available in religious communities. And we often do an anthropology of these ideas. But he said, look, there is a philosophical vocation to this availability, approach to this availability of 
religious idea because it's a religious ideas have a community transcending power. For example, notions like God, uh, you know, uh, prayer, right? These are uh, many of these things, right? More, you know, some kind of a redemption, etc. These are not limited to these religious communities. It's available for uh, everyone. And he says it is his philosophical task that these, uh, you know, these ideas be made available to even non-religious people. I said it is indeed possible for. So I said how, uh, you know, we saw Walter Benjamin saying that my philosophy is like a blotting paper towards religious ideas. Ramayandra Gandhi says philosophy is like a magnet towards religious ideas. There is a certain connection between them. So idea of God, prayer, soul, miraculous, mystic, these are all, all to be available towards the non-taste, right? Now, so that's what you, so even though Ramajandra Gandhi claimed himself to Advaitin, he, I, I have never heard him quoting even a single sloga from Indian tradition, right? Shankara, there's no engagement with uh, any of them, right? Because for him, it is the, the idea of Advaita or any of these religious ideas have to be available from what is going on in our concrete uh, uh, world. And this, I, this notion of availability for him, what do, why, how do we make? So these ideas appear in the utterances of all these spiritual matters. What do we do with them? So one way is that you can have an explanation of them. You, know, you can have various explanation of these two. Right. And for example, there are brilliant uh, historical explanations of this work. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa by, uh, you know, uh, Partha Chatterjee has an uh, interesting work called The Religion of Armed Domesticity, Sri Ramakrishna. Right? So he looks at them, this and says, look, it is Sri Ramakrishna was, what he is actually allowing people to do is that it is helping the middle class to sort out the tension between the ambivalent tension of its class uh, you know, uh, position. And we have Sumit Sarkar's one, Kali Yuga, uh, Chakri and Bhakti, uh, Ramakrishna and his uh, chimes, right? Again, look at how a new idea of domesticity and working habits come into the Bengali middle class and how, uh, you know. Uh, so here what happens is that you provide an explanation from why they are doing it. He, they are doing a certain role which can be described without invoking any of these religious uh, uh, ideas. Another way is to say that you interpret these ideas, right? You interpret and say, okay, this is when well, you have now interpretations of say Narayana Guru. I'm sure, you know, today we can lift him also into this cricket team of sages, Narayana Guru. And uh, so you interpret it by saying that, okay, you know, this is, should be seen in terms of Shankara Sadhuveda, and then there is happening of caste differences, you know, the, he's fighting the Navodhana, uh, you know, uh, thinking. So you interpret it against a certain historical thing, right? Or you can translate it into any vocabulary. So you will find a certain, uh, but this idea of availability, which Ramajandra Gandhi is saying about this is available with these people, doesn't fall into explanation, interpretation, translation, or anything. Nor do we find anything called the uh, valorization of experience. When you say all the, oh, you have to experience, they have experience. So though there's a lot of talk about religious experience, that's not the point of entry of this, right? So for him, what he's saying is that what these people are doing, they are communing. What is happening is that there is a communication. They are talking to people, right? So. In this, he actually, so, that, so then he asked the question, what is at the heart of communication? Let's look at it. What is the essential nature of the communication? There is a look, there is one presupposition of communication, which is part of anybody talking to anybody else is for him, the idea about addressing, right? So that is the basic presupposition of communication. That is, I need to speak, right? So what do I do when I need to speak? What I need to do is when I need to speak is that I need to call your attention, right? In a non-manipulative way. I can actually throw a chalk at you and call your attention. That's not communication, right? I have to somewhere, uh, you know, create, right? Uh, in a very non-manipulative way, non-causal way, non-descriptive way, right? I can't just give a description. Oh, that person with 
white shirt sitting there, right? That's not addressing. And it is also non-referential uh, way and in a non-predicative way, right? So there is a certain, it's a very rich way in which I can relate to somebody else in this manner, non-manipulative, non-counsel, non-descriptive uh, way, right? So when I address, what I do is I address that person as an absolutely particular. He is not falling under any uh, stuff, right? Any description about this. So he says, look, this is what make communication possible, right? And this actually allows you to uh, relate to other people. You, I can bring other pe people, when I address somebody, I bring other people into a situation of them being absolute, unique particulars. I bring them into that consciousness of they being absolute uh, particulars as self-consciousness. Right? So if he says, look, this is what for him the Advaita is. Right? It's not a theory about anything. It's not a philosophical theory. It's a certain way in which everybody is brought into the self-conscious by being uh, addressed to this. Right? And uh, so this is something which is available. So this, what he calls Advaita was everybody, this is the whole world is, you know, self and self images, et cetera, is something which is a move which we all make in the everyday communication of this, right? So it is in this sense that then he will say that if you take this, you can see that everything, for example, when somebody is facing some, you, in order to be moral, you don't have to have belief in God. But you know, if, when you are at a limit situation where somebody is suffering, somebody is going to die, you can imaginatively explore the possibility of if somebody can actually do something, let him do, right? So this is all that you need to do. If somebody can, you take, you wish that if somebody can do something in order to make a difference, to alleviate this, let him do, right? He said, look, this is all that in addressing communication, if this much is available, this is all that. So in this way, I can say that all the, uh, you know, a concept of God uh, can be easily made available to a non myth it's a nothing makes, you don't have to believe in God. You need to have any specific descriptions of the God in order to have this idea. If somebody can do something, let him uh, do, right? So it is through these kinds of minimal uh, basic resources available in uh, our everyday communication, through which we should be able to access these, um, you know, religious ideas. And he said, doing these sages as people who actually call your attention to this part of the human communication level of these being addressed, right? So, we, so and he says, look, what they actually make you do is they, when you call them as thinkers, what you are actually trying to do is they issue a certain, not a speech act, a certain speech by which all that they want you to be is to a witness to that, right? So it's a very, very, very non-causal, non-manipulative address to the speech acts that is happening, uh, you know, here. That's all that all these spiritual masters are actually uh, calling you to do. Now, in order to do that, it is entirely free from any content of their philosophical views, uh, you know, etc. And it's very interesting when an actual occurrence happened in 1934, uh, you know, there was an earthquake where, uh, you know, Gandhi said it is people, uh, you know, uh, is a punishment for our practicing untouchability. And, you know, Tagore saying, look at that's nonsense. And, you know, he, the natural things happen like that. And uh, it has nothing to do with this. But Gandhi said, no, there is a connection between these two. Now, Ramachandri has a beautiful take on it. He's saying, look, What's happening there is that there's an absolute evil called untouchability, and there is a totally meaningless suffering of the people who did it, people who underwent that, right? So he said, look, if there is a totally meaningless suffering and there is a absolute evil that is happening, he said, look, being addressed by this is that you imaginatively explore the possibility of a connection between them which will not provide an explanation of this. If you provide an explanation of this, for example, he will not use caste here because caste will give an explanation to this. So look, this is a absolutely uh, 
superficial connection between these two, right? And this is all that you need to notice in order to, uh, you can think about a history which will just notice this about the 1934, uh, you know, that uh, event, right? So what that, that's a very superficial uh, history, right? So there, it's not the fact of that, right? It's not the meaning of that, but the very fact that these are just certain claims are made seriously, right? If you take this, these two, you see a totally meaningless connection, which will not explain it away cold, right? So uh, if you can think about history like that, right? You can think about a history of the 1934, where you can mark that that earthquake was a punishment for untouchability, right? Which connecting it like in this manner, right? We are actually freeing an extremely important connection between say something happening in nature and something happening in all human affairs without giving it any uh, depth, right? And it is these kinds of history, right? As we said, this is uh, you know formulated by historians, philosophers everywhere, but this is a history which is truly freed from any philosophy of uh, uh, you know, history. So can history save philosophy? Yes, history can save philosophy, basically from philosophy of uh, history and what we saw as some concrete instances where it works out, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sanil, for this wonderful and insightful talk. Now I would like to invite the chair, Professor G. Arunima, to the dais. So. so now the floor is open for discussions and questions. So. Uh, if you have joined by the Zoom meet, you can type the questions in the chat box. Otherwise, they can use the raise hand option. So we'll be taking the questions alternatively from online and offline audience. Thank you. Uh, this is um, Michael Tarakan. Hello. Can you, can you? Hear me? Yes, sir. It is audible. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that I could not uh, listen or follow most of Senil's um, uh, uh, in the beginning. It was worse, but even subsequently, um, it was not very forthcoming. I um, it was quite frustrating to me as a listener because. There are two or three words which I understand. And so I would make a wish was a very confident presentation by Sanil, which, um, which is the least that I could have expected from an academic of his background. So I wish him and all of you a very useful period of discussion and um, conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Darragan. I think we have a question from the floor. So could we just take that question, please? So you are mentioning about dialectical materialism and theology. Uh, now, political ideologies, whether communism, fascism, Nazism, they are all for the good of mankind, and uh, so that we will have a better, better world. But what happens is the theory per se is uh, very fine. That is why people, huge mass of people, get attracted to the the theory. But in practice, uh, that is not the way. In practice, what we happen, we see is that the excesses. Communism leads to Gulag and uh, Nazism leads to uh, Auschwitz and, uh, and uh, fascism also leads to no better way. Now, my question is, because you mentioned about uh, 
support a theology. See, does a philosophy philosophy formulate structures? No, I, I would uh, sort of reverse the question that you have asked. Uh, can philosophy save mankind? Because we are at a threshold where uh, a war is going on, and uh, and uh, that war is for for declared for the security of community, a political idea. So it is necessary that uh, Ukraine has to be invaded and uh, acquired uh, so that uh, communism can be safe. And uh, now it is threatened that. Uh, uh, even nuclear option is is valid in order to secure communism. It's a political uh, idea, as you were mentioning. Uh, and uh, today in Italy, uh, Mussolini fascist party has been elected to power. So Europe is also going very right. So those political ideologies that has been discarded because the practice has not been uh, in accordance with the theory. He's coming back very forcefully after so many years, after 70 years. So in this context, my question is, does, does uh, philosophy has a, uh, can, should, should not philosophy save man history? Well, you, I'm reversing the question that you asked. In the context that uh, philosophy will be able to formulate structures so that ideologies, so that uh, theories that has been formulated Will be will be will be practiced only within structures, so that there will not be any. Yeah, that's a very difficult question in the in the sense of the philosophy is saving the uh, mankind. Uh, and uh, of course, philosophy now, uh, you know, no longer, uh, we can see philosophy or as anything, right? Formulating a template for you know, human ideal life or ideal city. As in a philosophy, one thought that it can actually do, it can actually, uh, you know, Plato would write Republic and say that what is an ideal uh, society, you know, for a template, etc. That is not that philosophy can call upon. Uh, philosophy can do. But as you're rightly saying that uh, what is a philosophy can do, say, for example, when faced with something like fascism. Right? And uh, You know somebody like Walter Benjamin, and when he is actually speaking about uh, the connection between philosophy and theology, right? He said, "Look, if historical materialism has to win all the games it played, right? It needs to have this dwarf of theology hiding under it." Right? And this is said by somebody who will come, who is running away from Hitler, and would commit suicide uh, because he couldn't escape. Paris. Right? So, uh, from Ramajandra Gandhi's engagement, what I see is that today that there is, see, there is a certain way in which the religious, on the one hand, we say that you know, religious nationalism is leading to you know, fascism. But the, on the other hand, religion is explained away. Right? We want to give an explanation of religion, or we want to interpret it by saying that, okay, by Advaita, they say everybody is the same and hence there is no gender difference, no uh, uh, caste difference, right? What you are trying to say is, okay, these guys are doing some religious talk. I will, I have certain other secular vocabulary. I will put it in that and I will make sense of it. The other one is, no, 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 religion is ideology. And, you know, we can actually explain what religion is doing in a sense. So that's an explanatory paradigm. So the idea is whether we can look at it, uh, approach to religion, something in another way, which is neither that of explanation nor interpretation. So is there any way in which these religious vocabulary, for example, for me, who is a non-religious person, non-theist person, can these 
you know we use all these things all the time right for example something like prayer is it available to me as somebody who seriously pursues right so we often write i think recently the kerala government said you don't have to pray in your applications right otherwise even a simple application you write as if you are writing to the god right so it's a colonial habit but can we seriously think about something called these you know ideas of miraculous etc available to us right now i am posing this as a question about can we respond to our situation in the world where there is so much of religious talk there is so much of spiritual uh, you know debate discussion or these things available to us Th- that is the question i was uh, trying to pose right other one is like for example you know that we can think about all these things you know we have all kinds of explanations about there are psychoanalytic explanation about some you know paramahamsa by saying that you know you can give a psychoanalytic perspective why are these people doing their relationship with women etc right so can we get out of this explanatory paradigm right and just think okay there is some thought happening there these these concepts we can also move so that we are in the game is that something like that possible right for me the question is that it needs a sensitivity to our historical context and so a certain opening to our historical context in this way. and i see what's happening in lot of you know people like foucault uh, you know uh, they you know they read that they, they use these people as seen as postmodernist etc but what actually happening in there is they are actually trying to look at something very singular happening in our historical moment how can i be precisely get at that that's what they are at there's something real which is happening in our context how do we get at that that can history allows us to have this confrontation with it and if they call themselves archaeology not because archaeology is some scientific technique right that's not the thing right we often say that okay we have archaeology but we need to interpret it through its historical uh, you know stuff and you know for example in in india in kerala historiography if you look at it there is a kind of family story marxism which will make sense of everything right they say marxist but but here is a marxist who take his profession seriously like water benjamin and he is finding it important that look his philosophy is like a blotting paper there's an affinity with the religious uh, question and that is because he is sensing something in his own fascism to make this bold thing is not scared of saying this i don't know that i was interested. you monitoring the question sir yes ma'am so there is a question by susan harris great talk could you elaborate more on non casual kind of addressing in a speech act and its connection to witnessing what kind of history does it present is it a kind of performance as well yeah it is uh, you know what trying to say where do we locate something like Now let's talk the question about speech act right so speech act is a theory which says that every speech is an act right whenever we say something we are doing something we are requesting we are describing we are thanking we are ordering etc right now ramjendra gandhi actually turn it around and he says look whatever you do there is a speech right whatever you do there is a speech every doing is a speech now how do we listen to that so he says look what is that make every doing into pick every doing there is something which is address which you are being addressed right so our primary relationship is the communicative relationship as being addressed is so it look this is for him the important place for us to establish a connection with it's a religious talk he might even say that if you look at it uh, you know uh, you might say that if i give a scientific talk and even artistic talk you need to have a notion if something is communicating to me that means i need to be addressed and this addressing has two things for him first of all that he moves from it's a very interesting move where we move from and that if i can address somebody means that i can bring him to consciousness as a self which is 
not under any description, under any predication, etc. Right? It is possible because we are all set. Now there is, he says, look, two people cannot play. Two people can only. This whole play is because we are all one. That's the big Advaita vision. That it's not going to uh, that. The, so the idea is, you need to be attentive to this address. It's for a historian, for anyone, anybody who needs to relate to reality through human language. We need to think about this idea of uh, being addressed. And uh, what was the second part of this? What kind of history does it present? Is it a kind of performance as well? Yes. So now the uh, issue is to look at the world itself, right? Our relation, basic relationship to reality as one of being addressed to. That is the idea which he is, uh, you know, proposing for. Uh, to. So, for example, witnessing for him, what does it mean to say that I think? Right. I think I use language in order to think. Right. So how is thinking different from say describing or something? Right. Is it thinking is a peculiar way in which I use language and I expect people to just witness this. Right. I can do this, so for example, quoting someone is doing. Like I quote someone by saying that, look, I quote this, I say, look, I am not saying it is right or wrong, but it is like this. Right. So I can playfully actually say something. When playfully say something, I mean, look, don't take me seriously. Right? So if you actually take me seriously, I will say, no, I didn't. Right? So we can say something by which you, what you merely do is that you are taken seriously. Right? I don't judge what you are saying is true. I don't try to add, find meaning in what you say. Right? So what I merely look at is that I just I just take it seriously that you have said something. Can we look at, uh, you know, human actions, our relationship to the world in terms of this? He said, look, this is what, uh, there can be a historical relation, a historian who will look at it, all the utterances which are made in the world like this. And, uh, and he says, look, that is possible. And for, for example, for, you know, you take somebody like Gandhi when he said that it is, you know, this earthquake is actually a punishment for something. And he says, look, it's also possible that untouchability is right. And this is a punishment for Gandhi opposing untouchability. Right? That's also fine. Right? Is it one of these? Right? You should be able to respond to one of these links. That's absolute for, for you being a humanity. So imagine a way of formulating your problems uh, uh, like this. Right? And you know, this is very important when we talk about something like uh, you know, fascism and all that. Today, I'm sure you know, our anti-fascist politics is like, you must have seen that Umberto Eco's article. Right? So there is this 14 factors by which you can identify a fascist. So you know, and then you can actually find your fascist. Now, now, what happens is everybody is a fascist. We call Modi fascist. Modi will call Kaidiriwala a fascist. They will all say Indira Gandhi is a fascist, right? So everybody, you can put anybody into that uh, kind of, right? Now, these kinds of a classificatory logic is not going to be sensitive to what is dangerously fascist in our historical uh, context. And my submission is that it is philosophers who are preventing you from doing it, right? And uh, historians are freeing themselves from this. They are gaining their ability to relate to their, right? And one of this is taking place in what Ramajindra Gandhi is giving us is that, look, he's showing, okay, in the spiritual level, I am going to tell you, here are people, right? You have somebody like Ramana Maharshi who uh, never went to the, the Indian political movement, you know, freedom struggle is happening. He never goes to the freedom. Uh, struggle or getting involved in it or anything, right? So, but is he, you know, in some sense recording his uh, reality, even though he is not, uh, you know, going there. We can all like we go for a talk and participate, but he doesn't do that. Right? So, but the same way, when you say that a constellation of uh, sages, I don't see why it cannot be a constellation of revolutionaries. 
you go to any party office in india you know there are three four pictures are there right so how do you think about okay why are those pictures are there what is it the signature putting you know for revolutionary leaders pictures in our party offices there should be a certain way of relating to it what is it uh, about you know how the contestation that happened where x has to be there y has to be there which happens in the spiritual world also right so tamandar ji says i am thinking about a non exclusionary cricket team of sages everybody will in principle be enlisted uh, uh, into this so in that sense it's not uh, like it is the issue is not is it religious or it is political or it is artistic can we think about a different perception about historical reality in this can we think about our lives or politics which will will be guided by that sensitivity hello um the wave of change change within courts sweeping across europe talked about uh which was that country italy brothers of italy coming to power in italy now in a country like sweden as well next it would be denmark societies where you don't have god they have been existing for a long period of time how do you explain it the change that is, you talked about history history is not saving that's what we haven't learned from history that should be one of the reasons why this change is sweeping across europe now it would come to asia as well that is one i want to ask another thing is regarding your reference to ramachandra gandhi in 1934 even if though it sounded like a quip or whatever it is 2018 we had floods and here people were saying that it's because we were trying to open the walls of the padmanabha temple i do not know how you explain it and the constellation of sages that you were referring to how did this uh, narendra transform himself into vivekananda without understanding that context we cannot talk about these three sages to me when you say that there is some sort of a communication that communication has to be two way it should not be a one way communication not through just looks or gestures what is important here is we find that all these sages that we have been mentioning or we have been hearing about is through their gestures their looks fine looks the way they talk the necessary pauses in between we are carried away by it some side some sort of a mesmerizing effect and last but not the least you had referred to foco and i would be interested to know foco you said very well was interested in dates yes he was very intelligent an intellectual personality did he ever record his obsession or his pedophile experiences with black arab boys at the cemeteries did he ever record it so are these mere preachers or teachers how can history save us it is interesting listening to you thank you no i definitely share your anxiety today about you know in italy the a party supported by mussolini's grandson is coming into power right now what is our how do how do we think about the politics today so our general idea about politics today is that look we will explain why this is happening right we have a general law about like like a newton's law of history right which will help us how fascism has come into that and then this is an instance of it so we will ensure that this is, we know this explanatory framework doesn't work for right this is something which is known to us for long time that is you know we cannot think about intervention of politics in terms of an explanatory uh, framework 
in fact we think that in science we can do it but we know technology is not given by such you know science actually derives some conclusions from general laws and then such technology goes and applies it it doesn't even explain technological function right so let alone with it, which will not explain so it cannot be the idea that uh, we can have some general laws of history right marxists had that illusion all the time that you know there are some general laws of history and you know when you know lenin saying that the evolution the revolution happened in russia because the chain broke at the weakest link so you can explain everything but we don't you know today the marxist understanding of its own practice is no longer that right not that it was marx understanding about right no the other one is as you saying you know you can explain everything about all these you know i am not a as i said i am you know genetically incapable of religious faith right so there is no defense of you know and there are psychoanalytic explanation of about why all these guys actually these gurus attracts people's attention right and the theories about charisma how they are you know all this i am noting they are all we can pursue them full blown right so but what is there is do we want to attend to a certain spiritual climate along with the life is going on in this country right is there any way of responding to it right and and i said there are two historical accounts by sumit sarkar and parthachar which are very sensitive account they are not coming out with such general laws etc but at the end of this they said look how can we make sense of it right no so that way i fully agree with you that we can do all those things but uh, we are in, i am interested in only if it if, if we have any any other uh, possibility of this and we see that how foco was actually responding to a certain situation in iran as political spirituality right this question was not alien to him what happened in uh, you know politics and definitely foco will be questioned with respect to many of these uh, things even though what foco tell why are we all the time worried about what he did in this but that's why what is our interest a philosopher read and say but tell us about what you did in your bedroom right so we he also thinks about what is our nature of this sexual curiosity which we are he he enabled us to pose those questions but on that thing i think there are all these questions you know which about all these things philosopher and about ramachandra gandhi himself we may ask these questions so um, i won't undermine the room for uh, such questions and such explanations will definitely be there are three questions by rajeshwari the first one is how is the religious and non philosophy framing history how can it save history from multiple truth perceptions to reality to an extent the second one is in contemporary history how is the popular culture social media mass media design and redesign philosophy of history the third one is how the place and space determines the actual realities in different periods as well as areas geological areas focuses on arabian philosophy and eastern philosophy especially chinese southeast asian countries rather than western ideological hegemony over philosophy of knowledge so these are all very dense uh, questions so you need to listen to me talking for another one hour to answer all of them i don't think either you me nor you want to do that but just quickly because they are all very important uh, questions first of all that what we uh, as geo philosophy is somebody is trying to make sense of uh, you know in a in an idea about history of philosophy which is not uh, you know governed by some philosophical notions of history he is that's what people like delius tried to do lock it makes sense of this idea that the western enterprise of uh, philosophy and it's up to us to do such work for uh, you know indian uh, philosophy or other traditional work and i see this as uh, you know ramachandra gandhi's work as one step of going through that how do you think about the 
history of uh, Indian philosophy, which we have a history of Indian philosophy, which is, you know, given to us by Max Muller, looked at all the six darshanas, and we now think about the debate between us, and we can, we, we, we consolidated into this thing, which looks more or less like the Western uh, history. Right? There are a lot of people today saying that, okay, we, we also had, you know, this idea about whatever we ascribe to Western philosophical thinking really happened in uh, Indian philosophy. Also, you have been, you know, Amartya's argumentative thing. They are also doing it uh, like this. Or you turn it around the other way and say, no, 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 there is something which is uniquely culturally different from that, which we will, finally, we will articulate here in one sense. Right? So, at least we have, what we have seen in today's discussion is that in the West, philosophers try to disabuse themselves of uh, this idea. Now, how, after that, how do we think about engaging with these philosophy? Right? So we have somebody like Ramachandra Gandhi who claimed to be an Advaitin, but related to Advaita tradition, not through these texts and textual commentaries, uh, you know, etc. The same way today we need to ask the question, okay, what is Advaita for? Uh, you know, uh, Sri Narayana Guru. So we can say that we can think about a certain historical climate where we will, okay, we need a certain ideology of every human being is the same, right? And uh, we can interpret it in, in, in that way. Uh, but does that, uh, does justice to Narayana Gandhi, the Ramachandra Gandhi's, uh, no, Sri Narayana Guru's uh, philosophical impulse or what philosophy has to take from uh, you know, him, right? So, uh, you know, you find T.M. Krishna experimenting with the idea and say what a musician has to take from poetry, right? So, some such basic intervention we need to do. Uh, otherwise, it becomes a kind of ideological construction of uh, uh, that. So, that work, you know, that's my response. That work we need to uh, really do. So, what I try to do is, okay, what is the major you know, configuration where we can problematize both history of philosophy and philosophy of history. Why we are doing it, we are not immediately saying anything about history as such, because we are starting with the assumption that history of philosophy in some sense throws, is an exemplary instance of history itself, right? And that exemplarity, it claims under uh, philosophy of history. So can we think about that and then address the question of history and history of philosophy in a different manner? And I think this is important because, uh, uh, you know, the, we today need an explanation about why is it that something like colonial, post-coloniality is a big uh, issue in other disciplines of social sciences, why it is not impinging on philosophers, right? Is it that they are, uh, you know, you find somebody like Narayana Guru asking a different take on uh, saying that the, I got Diksha from the British and you have somebody like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Gandhi has a certain take and you have uh, Ramana Maharshi has a different take. So how do we understand these responses? So Sanil, a very a basic doubt about philosophy or the nature of it. There is in different uh, areas of human engagement, like even science or medicine or even uh, economics history, we find that always there is a body of knowledge, the current body of knowledge, which is accepted. So even though hypothesis and new movements are always there, there is that all happens within the frame of the current uh, knowledge, uh, body of knowledge. Does philosophy have that? I mean, both Western as well as Eastern. In, we always see different schools of thought being uh, discussed or dif the views of different philosophers. But other than that, as the major accepted knowledge of uh, body of knowledge, so that be because that becomes, I think, a point from which you can move forward and move forward towards engagement rather than only interpretation. That is my question. Yes, you're absolutely right. You know, as the, when we encounter philosophy, that's what we happen. There are different views on things. We want to know what is the 
the right view, et cetera, right? So uh, <clears throat> in some notion of theoretical thing, we say, okay, we need to pitch it against reality and find out what it is, right? Now we know we cannot even give an account of our growth in knowledge in science by doing this, that different perspectives on reality and you actually pitch your theory against re a theory independent reality, right? And then we can do it. And then we next step we say that, okay, there is no theory independent reality or reality is, uh, you know, theoretically uh, constructed. Then we look for something very pragmatic way of dealing with, uh, okay, why do we choose one over the uh, other, right? Now, what do we do if you, if both are not accessible to us? Okay. And that's the question we, philosophy from the very beginning has been posing it by looking at his, its own, uh, you know, history. And we said the two solutions it gave classically was that, okay, let's systematize this and we can give you uh, how uh, all these are partial stages, right? Partial views on an integrated vision, we can actually post facto, we can come up with. Right? And we saw the dangers of that uh, uh, happening. So the issue is neither of these are acceptable for philosophical uh, uh, discussion. And you see, I think uh, Professor Tarragon in the beginning, I think we couldn't hear him. So can we go back to him and get his questions? What he was saying was that he couldn't hear. I think there was some connectivity issue. So he barely got two or three words, is what I understood. Mm. Yeah. ask if you could say more about a couple of things. The first is uh, when you say uh, religious, um, uh, most of the things you said can't be replaced religious and say ethics or ethical. I don't mean it particularly as a terminology question. Um, in, in the sense that um, so you had this complaint that you know that um, philosophy of history, for instance, there the, the problem between text and context. The context absorbs everything. The text disappears. Whatever uh, that we were seeking to explain uh, is absorbed into the explanation with any uh, remainder. Uh, so and so these things, communication, sensitivity, those the words that you used enable us to remain at that level itself without without being absorbed into the system. or into a higher this transcendental progress and truth. That's the issue. So why why religious? Uh, so that was one if you could say say more about why you wouldn't say ethics. Ethics not as sadhajaram, not not that person. Uh, and the second is to uh, do with um, this question of the you know moving into a transcendental um, or, or remaining these things, whatever it is we are seeking to quote unquote explain, remain at that level. But what is the difference between the explanatory uh, level and this level? Are we to say that it's uh, the other one is useless, that you know we should do away with those? Uh, but if they have value, what sort of relation uh, does that level have to this? Religious slash ethical level. I think maybe. Yeah. yeah, that's also a very uh, disturbing question, and I don't have a definite answer why uh, we don't why don't we call it ethical and why religious? And 
let us take it in why do by these sages whom he is studying right why don't why doesn't he call them uh, ethical right because of a certain understanding of ethics which we have which has to something to do with actions and actions have some theologically all our actions have to be directed towards some good and and because many of these uh, sages are not into great action right uh, so and uh, they act occasionally but there there seems to be the worry is not about action guiding power that's not what they right and for example for ramachandra gandhi there is a kind of argumentative he start with the idea about addressing so addressing gives him a, a clue to the advaita we are all the we are all images of some self self is the basic notion of reality for him and if self is the basic notion of reality that we are every element of this reality has value hence non violence that's the take he is uh, going right so uh, i think they are religious we are not immediately calling them ethical because of this that is so we are not in the domain of merely actions but generally it's a cosmology which is trying to work out can we get through the sages right through their what he called an integralism see he bring there's a certain integrality to all these seven you know this things which are come that not because you know we as they have all you know we have a certain way of saying that all religions lead to the same end all religion god is love right these are not the thing which he is trying he said there is a certain cosmological uh, pursuit Uh, which they are actually uh, doing so it's cosmological and not uh, uh, ethical immediately that's not the way uh, it is done otherwise you know they are all telling you how to get mental peace that's what our theory about all these you know people are uh, middle class people they are don't have a certain rootedness in modernity or tradition so these guys are actually give them uh, mental peace right in fact this mental peace theory is very interesting because you know i asked my undergraduate students do you believe in god they tell you oh, we don't really believe in god is a reality but we believe in it for our mental peace the amazing reflexivity they are capable of not only that they know there is no god but they know what is mental peace right so i think that's not the level at which he is uh, uh, you know tracking but definitely there is a link to the ethics one should be able to uh, connect it and you know i think at the end of the day there is no there's no need to think about this as consolation of sages and only spirituality can uh, lead us ramachandra gandhi wrote a whole book on one painting by theyab mehta right where he said that's also what theyab mehta is doing is what ramana maharshi is doing right so uh, that kind of a sage who this and for example he very clearly says his lecture on indian spirituality in the west he says look we gave you ramana maharshi you gave us gita garbo and marlin mantra right so it's uh, that's the level of exchange at which so there is i don't think there is any deep level of spirituality meaningfulness of religious life which is involved here my question is uh, what uh, shouldn't i mean uh, philosophy or science or rather science was actually called an uh, natural philosophy and practice and the practitioners were called natural uh, philosophers at one point uh, before they were called scientists so uh, my question is uh, my um, question or a comment rather is that uh, perhaps the only uh true language so in in this conversation itself the discussion itself many people are, uh, use many terms fascism communism etc but these are all very contextual it means different things to different people uh, over a, 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 a huge amount of space and time like you know as uh, society progresses it, you know these uh, terms and things keep changing right so this uh, so the only constant which is there which doesn't change is probably i mean the language 
of communication which doesn't change is probably mathematics because uh, mathematics is the you know the language in which the science is written or rather natural philosophy is written so if you think about it in that sense and if we give it uh, in in that sense what is the you know uh, i mean we should have a baseline because if we don't have a baseline in this communication right there is there is going to be a lot of uh, you know because uh, what i think may be different from what you think or what you interpret what i say right so so this baseline is uh, so i in my opinion we should think from first principles and derive a, a paradigm in which say we already know that some of these things are already true like say natural laws natural laws of philosophy or natural laws of science these are written in the laws of maths and these they don't change they, they were true centuries back they are true today also so in terms of human human interactions you know human interactions so uh, two heavenly bodies say sun and earth are governed by the laws of uh, newton you mentioned you you yourself mentioned newton's law right so newton's law and you know certain uh, you know maxwell's law and things like that electricity's laws so we should think of human interactions as you know bodies we are bodies and we are interacting and there are certain laws so when there is a breakdown of laws you have uh, you know we cannot imagine that in the Uh, heavenly sphere or in the you know in the natural sphere because there is no breakdown of laws if there is a breakdown of laws the universe ceases to exist we don't we we ourselves ex don't exist but if this interaction is there then i mean if this laws are uh, these laws are unwritten laws because they are abstract you cannot see those abstract laws right so my my comment i make uh, this one is maybe there are we should think in first principles that these uh interactions between humans or society rather there are some laws and these laws were broken and uh, you know philosophy is an explanation of uh you know these broken laws or perhaps it should go back to the uh, state uh, or the explanation of how these laws were broken or uh, you know in the unbroken state so what is uh, i think that should be our first principle uh, derivation or or first principle thinking of such uh, you know uh, scenarios rather than you know what many spiritual people say because the uh, because we know that natural philosophy is true that is what the the world we live in and world we experience so that is the only baseline we have all other baselines are you know all other you know terms and you know terminologies and isms and all are may mean different thing to different people the same thing you know can be interpreted in different ways so what is your uh, you know i would say comment or a question or whatever you want to take like ask you a few questions and then respond to it in the uh, i have come to your side so i think more two more there and then this gentleman wants to ask a second question so let those be the last questions to ask us how do you want Would you like to give me a hand? Yeah. Yeah. No. You know, it's. I I, I wish I could uh, think with you about this issue, but uh, as you said earlier, there was a time when philosophy was, science was natural philosophy, right? And uh, but. today it's not right? and what i was trying to say that this is the work of historians this is a damage historians have done for us right they said look these are all changing perspectives right there are we can identify the uh, basic views under which newtonian physics is possible how what is changing from ptolemyian physics to copernican <coughs> physics or from aristotelian to you know newtonian thing you need to look at the history of science what is changing right so they plugged in history right 
and kill the peace of mind which we had. We thought there is some laws which are governing. We will figure out that, right? So these historians uh, spoiled our that dream. And now what I was trying to say that historians could spoil it by playing the philosophy game, right? Philosophy of history game they were playing in order to deny us. There was a time when philosophy could elaborate a theory of everything. Right? And uh, not only to philosophy, they did it to mathematics. Today you say mathematics is not changing, but no longer the case, right? Not only that there is a rich history of mathematics, right? the way mathematics relates to, for example, in India, we had extremely vigorous astronomical research, but we didn't have anything like Euclidean geometry. Right? So we didn't find Euclidean geometry pertinent to uh, exploration of the universe. Right? And they said, look, it is because that's what the, when uh, Husserl wrote the origin of <coughs> geometry, he said, look, why is geometry is, idealities are there, their applicability, to Newtonian history has nothing to do with science having a method or scientific reality is out there. It is actually historical work. Right? There is a certain way in which there is a certain way the scientific community is possible in the West, which made this possible. Right? So some of the things which you said are untenable for us because of the work of uh, uh, you know, historians. Right? Now, uh, what people like Walter Benjamin or these Foucault, they are involved in philosophy, in the actual political engagement. They said, look, we want a real encounter with reality, right? We are not looking at it various perspectives, right? Revolution is not something which we want to happen later, right? Which will finally some event which will happen, which will satisfy our theories. Right? So uh, now I'm, my suggestion was that we can look at it as historians, finally liberated themselves from the tyranny of philosophy of history. And that's a chance for we philosophers also to relate to the history of philosophy. So in fact, Nancy Catrate has this book, which says, how does the, how do the laws of science, physics lie? Right? So what we think about the laws of physics as something true, right? It's very easy to say they are actually lies. And they work, right? For that, it doesn't have to be true. Another thing is that the reality is so chaotic, but we have these stable islands, right? And scientific laws are actually maps of those stable islands. So in these things, uh, these kinds of things, these historians is denied us. So philosophy can, science is no longer natural philosophy because of these historians. And this is what is happening with, you know, modernity and, there's something called history of science. I'm going to uh, misuse my role as the chair and moderator, and I have two quick questions for you. One is to take us back to the speech act theory analogy and, um, and where we are actually looking at, you know, um, Ramu Gandhi's, since I haven't read any of that work, I'm going by your reading of his, uh, you know, uh, of him in relation to these, uh, the constellation of sages. And so the question really is, uh, if one is to use that as the analogy, is it something like miracle work? Is it show and tell? I mean, do we actually respond to this because there's the ability to show something? Right? Or if it's a purely non-cognitive thing. So what is actually being demanded of those who are witnessing the uh, constellation? Uh, what is the demand that the constellation makes of the audience? Right? What is the relationship? Is there any relationship other than being there showing what they're doing? Right? Does that, should that be the way to think about it? And the reason I ask that is that one of the ways in which Hindutva uh, analyzes history and speaks about history is to speak about what they call ancient India as a realm of sages. Right? Um, and that is the sort of uh, site of pure knowledge and uh, good behavior and all the rest. Of it. And then you have a long period of darkness and 
colonization, starting with, of course, Islam in their case, to, uh, you know, British colonialism and so on. And now in the kind of moment of liberation, what do we have again? We have, we are able to witness miracles by sages like Sadhguru and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. So, so there's a very interesting kind of, I mean, this is a poor <laughs> comparison, but I think there is something that we do need to think about in relation to speech act theory and how far it can actually go. I'm wondering whether that is the way we want to think about it. That's one. The second is to take you back to uh, the history of philosophy, um, Benjamin's um, thesis on the history of philosophy and think about the two images. It's not just the one image. So of course there is the uh, hookah smoking dialectical materialism being manipulated by the dwarf that is theology, but there's also Angelus Novus, which is being pushed facing this kind of future that is a state of ruins. Uh, now it is an interesting question about how we make these two images speak to one another. What is it that we can do if we make this ruinous future speak to a manipulated uh, dialectical materialism by theology, is that one way to do it? Or should there be other ways of making the images speak to one another? Or should that not be the kind of way to approach what, is, what I think is actually, a, you know, he's such an imagistic philosopher. So how do we actually respond to not just the one, but the two images in that text? The next question is by Mr. Koshi Taragan. Thanks, Sunil. It was a stimulating talk, though I am still processing much of the things you have said. Are you suggesting that history can save philosophy by addressing through geophilosophy? And in the con context of philosophy in India, does the geophilosophy inevitably contains religious signpost? Okay. The next question is by Ivan Ayer. Thank you for the talk. It seems that the import of Ramachandra's image of the sages and their relevance towards articulating a philosophy and a history is both immanent and universal. It seems in this regard, a call towards something like a census communist, what Kant will th theorize with regard to the singular and yet universal nature of pure aesthetic judgment. Is a theological mode of an immanently universal philosophy premised on the assumption of a shared universal aesthetics of philosophical thinking? that you are subsequently asked. Uh, my, point is, uh, my point is, uh, see, the political ideas that I was talking about are basically rooted in, in philosophers, philosophers' writings as they themselves acknowledge. So it goes to Nietzsche for Nazism and, Nazism and uh, Hegel gets the credit for dialectical material, which brings me to a very, very superficial way of looking at things, very immature way of looking and saying that. But for these philosophers, these political ideas will not have come. And Oy. this is not a have. Which, so, so on that uh, uh, very superficial level, I would also think about this Pandora's box, where uh, these philosopher writings, you know, open up veritable Pandora's box. Here you the, 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 the holistic question, the holistic point that I would raise is, uh, what is the total, the contribution of philosophy to mankind seems to be very negative. I hope that you will be able to totally rebut me on this goal. That my process, the positive that I made, I am totally wrong. Thank you. Okay, I have two minutes to respond to everybody. About uh, philosophy's damage, I fully agree with you. That's it's where I go with Marx, who says philosophers have been fully interpreting the world, that to bad interpretations, right? As if they need we need interpretation, the task is to change it, right? I think it's however, however we understand, I think there is a kernel of truth uh, in that. Now, quickly come to uh, Arnima's question about uh, image and the text. It, it's interesting because the Image, people know that, you know, in the Orient, there are images, people think through images and they don't have concepts. That's the problem. That's why India we didn't have. And Hegel says how 
we have this idea about Brahma. <laughs> but it's a total. But you know, Indians, when they try to picture it, there is minimum four heads and 10 hands and all that, right? They can never get it uh, right, right? So this is a sign of. guarding line boundary which prevents them with, with the images sticks out to come uh, these like the european thinking geophilosophy what it does it is actually as archaeologist says there is a greek strata into it right that greek strata should be seen as dispersion away it's not like one point we say after which it is no more you know the archaeologist knows this their evidence is there earthquakes will happen floods will happen right it is despite all these things that they will be alien, they will be able to deviate a certain uh, uh, strata. In that sense, you know, it is a way in which, and that is the problem. This what is we, uh, you know, Ramachandra on this point is done that we have to take our spiritual master seriously. See that there, we can actually there is these are whatever they are doing through these crazy things you know, rambling. That's something which many of these guys, he said, look, you should listen to all these spiritual masters as if they are rambling, right? But even when you take somebody rambling seriously, you engage with them, right? So they have, the ideas are available. If you can listen to other people's rambling, then that's enough, right? So in, in that way, this opens that even to read, you know, people like water wisdom and Gumbi generally, so they are in the state. Plato onwards, when the crucial moment the philosopher happens, he will get to some story, some image, etc. Right? And we think that, okay, we need to really extract and say what is there, interpret, explain. Now, they think, no, it's immediately available to you in some uh, manner that we should be able to, and what prevents you from doing this is a peculiar teleology you construct between there is image, then there is abstract thinking. There are the sages and their wisdom and philosophers and up their concept. So look, there is no dividing line between uh, them. And about uh, the other question about uh, uh, geo, uh, you know, philosophy essentially being uh, religious that I said, there is no such uh, necessary, uh, you know, we are mapping, Ramajan Gandhi is only doing it for religious. I don't think it is, there is any way we should say essentially religious. That's what we should just go to any revolutionary party office Look at the say the revenue comrades picture they have, and we should be able to do this work so that we know how to listen to these, uh, you know, um, uh, revolutionaries. And another thing was about uh, looking at it from uh, the uh, question about uh, sensuous communists and the aesthetics. I think even to reflect on that question, I would need around three hours. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for that question. I now I'd like to invite Ms. Sandhya Essen, Publication Assistant KCHR, to deliver the vote of thanks. Good evening. This has been a very interesting uh, evening of discourse between the history of philosophy and the philosophy of history. Though the subject is very vast, it's that our time limits to close the uh, public talk event now. So on behalf of KCHR, for the sake of uh, formality, I express my sincere thanks to our director, Professor Atlima for chairing the session. And uh, this was a very wonderful and insightful talk, sir. So we express our sincere thanks to you also, Professor Sanil, sir. Thank you so much. And from the discussion, we, we can understand how engaging was the talk. So uh, I express my thanks to each and every person who have responded to the talk and also participated in the uh, public uh, seminar uh, in offline and online. And but not last but not the least, our KCHR team, uh, 
it's I express my gratitude to our team to have uh, organized one and offline. And then let us uh, start mastering uh, the way of uh, addressing everything in a non-manipulative, non-casual, non-referential, and non-productive way so that we, we can understand everything and every questions in a different way and insight. And thank you very much, sir. And uh, one and all, once again, thank you very much. <laughs>